There we go. People are starting to log on, connect in. That's great. Um, and hopefully you managed to get the uh, notes, which I posted to Facebook a little while ago. Um, and we just tonight going to look at some notes from the rectory study group that I did a while ago. Uh, looking at the question, wh why didn't everyone understand that Jesus was divine? Um, and I'm glad we did that study because it's often a question that comes up for people. There's, you know, how could people not have got it? Um, how could they not have understood those sorts of things? Uh, and it's worthwhile doing because so often when we uh, read it, read the stories of Jesus, we read the Bible, we already have in our minds that Jesus is God with us, uh, is the Son of God, whatever you know picture you might have. Um, but uh, we are coming with that knowledge that we've been given. Uh, and we, you know, um, we have the advantage of hindsight. Whereas, and this seems really obvious to say, but is worth saying, the Gospels are written after the event, but they're describing pe things that are happening to people in the moment, uh, if that makes some sense. I hope it does. So um, hopefully you've got the notes. They're not very exciting this week. They're mostly just a mishmash of text and text boxes and things. But they're there. Uh, they're on Facebook. And um, they're also on the website uh, and under uh, hmm, Sermons and Series. So I wanted to start with a, a reading from Matthew. And it's Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 16. I figure I sometimes build this as a Bible study, so we should have some Bible stuff. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I chose that passage because it does point to some of the uh, complexity, if you will, that was in the world uh, around Jesus at the time. Um, you know, there, there's about three or four different titles in there. You know, so uh, some say John the Baptist. Uh, Elijah, one of Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. So, so there was this idea that at least one of the previous prophets was in some way incarnated or reincarnated in Jesus. Simon Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, technically, that's still not a divine term. So uh, Messiah means just Christ uh, or anointed and anyone could be anointed but we kind of put a capital M when we're talking about the anointed and son of the living God probably divine but it, there's still some debate as to whether or not this was seen as perhaps uh, kind of like a, a particular high point title for Jesus but not necessarily divine, if you know what I mean. It's like, he's there, but he's... he's um, you know, we might, uh, we might say semi-divine almost, or, or a demigod if we were Greek, or something like that. So, um, you can see that even in this context, there's some wiggle room for people not to go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, Jesus is divine, he's God with us. So I want to have a quick look at some of the texts that lead into uh, the Jewish picture of God at the time. 
So obviously we're going to be looking at what we would call the Old Testament because Christian. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so the first passage that I want to give to you is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You, you, that may sound familiar because we will often say in church, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. Um, and the way that was interpreted and understood was to suggest that there is a truly unique nature to God, such that there can be no other thing that is comparable to or even like God. And kind of comparing with the, um, the Greek picture of God, um, you know, there were multiple different gods running around in, in the Greek pantheon, uh, and the gods were basically like heroes, maybe just a bit bigger, a bit more powerful, you know, those sorts of things, a bit more long-lived, um, a bit more tragic sometimes. And yet this Hebrew idea, this, this Jewish idea was that, no, 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 the nature of God is so unique that there is nothing like that. Um, and then Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Now, that's, you know, uh, that'll be, um, you know, Ten Commandments stuff. Uh, and part of it was it was interpreted as saying, you know, God cannot and must not be understood as having a being like other beings. So, um, you know, as we explain to, to kids in, in, in Sundays, in RI, in RE, you know, we have limits. I can only reach as far as my fingers can go. Um, my voice can only travel as far as the technology will take it. Um, we have limits. We are limited in, in very tangible ways. Some of our limits are around birth and death. There was a time before I was, and there will be a time after I am dead. So we get this kind of, we are beings limited in time and space. This does not apply to God. Uh, Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. So um, this is the burning bush, you know, uh, Moses takes up the sandals, burning bush. God said to Moses, I am who I am, or I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. And it all depends on how you kind of translate that. Um, and that kind of leads back to this notion that God has individuality, but God's individuality is boundless. It has no beginning. It has no end. Um, and then when we, when we take that idea, the, the unique nature of God, uh, who doesn't have being like other beings and whose, individu whose individuality is boundless. And we compare that to a human being. Uh, a human being is part of a group of beings that are called human. You know, we, we're mammals, we're, we're humans. We're, um, and we're similar to other human beings. You know, we, you, you walk down the street, you can see a human being and you can immediately recognize them as human. Um, and as I said earlier, as a human being, I have boundaries to my being. Some I can extend through the use of technology, uh, but I'm still bounded. And so you can see there's this, this massive gap between the picture of God that is there and the experience of, of, of walking alongside Jesus. So, yeah, it's, you know, if, if nothing else, it's really important that we understand that. Yeah, just, just, we go, wow. Now, there are some other titles um, and other things that, that we, we, we can say about Jesus, but which don't necessarily mean divine, but is kind of points to maybe but not necessarily. And that's part of what I want you, 
what's so important to understand. So when we use terms like Messiah, uh, I mean, in Chronicles it says, uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 22, uh, do not touch my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. And anointed is usually a consecrated person, a king, a priest, or a saint, uh, the Messiah. But can you see how those examples are not, you know, it's doing God's work, but that's very different from being God with us. Uh, the healer. So, um, you know, we often, we see these stories of Jesus healing people and we think, wow, I, I can't do that. Um, you know, <laughs> I wish I could be super handy, but I can't. Um, and when we, we look at that, um, we might kind of go divine, but one king's, he stretched himself upon, himself upon the king child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into again and he revived. So although Jesus was a healer, so was Elijah. You know, um, and, and there was no debate that Elijah was God with us. It was just a prophet. I shouldn't say just a prophet as if that's nothing. But Elijah was a prophet. Oh, sorry. sorry. Too much talking. Um, and even the kind of the mystical picture we have. Um, and I love the idea that in mysticism, part of what we experience is the sort of the, the breaking down of uh, the the experience of the gap between us and God. We experience this uh, universal oneness, this oceanic oneness. Um, you can bring him in. Oh. Um, bring him in. I'm going to have an assistant for a bit. John's fast asleep. You can tell from the fact that he's coming to visit. Hey, dude, look at that. Hello. As you can tell, he's fast asleep, isn't he? Snoring his little toothy chopper off. Um, <laughs> nah. So anyway, um, as I was saying, uh, in, in Jeremiah, we, we have Jeremiah, who's a prophet, who says, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I've put my words in your mouth. So that kind of uh, mystical experience uh, and, and the expression of that closeness to God, once again, isn't automatically an indicator of divinity. It's, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a prophetic picture, but not a divine picture. Oh, do you want to play with the computer? And I'm not going to let you. The sister's going to try and put you back to bed. Thanks, kid. Bye-bye. Ah. So, um, I, I, I want to keep moving. I'm going to move into the New Testament now. And I've got some stuff from John's Gospel. And the beginning of John's Gospel is, uh, it's, it's actually what's called the Logos Hymn. And it's this beautiful hymn that's actually part of like it's a creation hymn but it's this uh how do we think about creation in the context of christ being the word of god and i'm just going to read it for you i'm just going to read it for you uh, just reading john 1 1 to 5 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god all things came into being through him Without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Can you imagine singing that? That'd be just beautiful, wouldn't it? Um, especially if you had a good singing voice. Um, that'd be great. And, and you can see why it's, it's a hymn. It's, you know, people put it to music in various different contexts. So... That's John cluing us into something. That is, where does Jesus come from? How do we think about? He's starting the gospel. 
But remember what I said about the fact that not everybody kind of, you know, we've got the hindsight in a sense that they didn't have. Um, so just a little later in John's Gospel, during the calling of some of the disciples, we have this, this scene. Uh, so this is from John 1, 43 to 46. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida the city of Andrew, and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Nazareth, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Now, I mean, that's a weird question, isn't it? Like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But it's a really important question because the... The social and political and, and spiritual, we do this weird thing, um, weird by biblical standards, where we separate our state and religion and politics, and, and we, think, we, we, we think they're all separate. They didn't. Um, so Nazareth was not a place where you would expect something godly to come out of. Uh, it, was, it, was an, it was an ungodly place. In that regard. So, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him. A and Philip said to him, come and see. What we're getting there, though, is we're getting uh, the view of the people around Jesus uh, and their view of him. And so they would have gone going, you know, this, this is the guy who grew up in Nazareth and who who can't be godly because he comes from the wrong place, doesn't he? John clues us that, in fact, where God, where Jesus comes from is, is with, in the beginning was the Word, was God, the, the, the yeah, the Word of God. Uh, and so um, we have that advantage. But you can really start to see why in, in the time of Jesus, People didn't see him as divine. He was a being like other beings. He was limited. There was a time that, as far as they were, before he was born, um, he looked like other people. He had the, he, you know, he, he in many ways embodied what it meant to be a prophet. But that didn't mean divine or God with us, necessarily. Okay. And then, I suppose, in terms of the Gospels, we get to the, the trump, kind of the trump card as to why it would have been so challenging for people to accept the message that Jesus was divine. Uh, and that was the crucifixion. Um, and, it, you know, one way of looking at all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is thinking about these four people are trying to answer the question, why does Jesus matter given that he was crucified? You know, why should we hear what, what, who Jesus is given that he was crucified? Um, because you, you know, um, I've, I've told the story often, so you may have heard it. Uh, when I was scheduled to be ordained a couple of years ago now, um, my wife beautifully went into the jewelry store and um, she was going to buy me a cross. And the person behind the counter said, do you want a plain one or one with the little man on it? Because the person behind the counter didn't actually have this kind of understanding of what a crucifix was. And also, it was a jewelry store. Whereas if you think about what was happening back then, it was a means of crucifixion. And everybody knew because, first up, let's look at some geography. Uh, the place where Jesus was crucified, Golgotha, um, would have been located just outside the city. Um, but that means that in order to be crucified, you had to be taken out of the city or rejected from the city. Um, and you, you, so, so you were rejected by the political and religious authorities, you were rejected by the city, you were, people thought, 
rejected by God. So how could God, Jesus be divine and crucified? The geography doesn't make sense. He was literally out of the community. Um, crucifixion was intended to be gruesome. Uh, you know, it was done as partially as a punishment, but also significantly as a warning. You know, if you if you saw someone crucified, you would probably go out of your way to avoid that. They were stripped naked, they were beaten, they were nailed or tied to to a crossbar and sometimes on a tree or on a post. Um, it didn't look nice, like you see the pictures, you know, the the artwork with like a hill and three little crosses. Uh, it was brutal and confronting. It was used to punish slaves and, you know, enemies of the state. These were not people who had authority or dignity. And so this would have been a major problem for anyone of Jesus' time uh, to just go, well, I, how can you possibly think that Jesus is divine when Jesus was crucified, ejected from the city, painful? And, and finally, there's that kind of theological step that's just so difficult for people to overcome which is what do you do with this I, I, and, I, and I've actually got a little bit there from um, sorry my notes are on my computer which is just kind of there um, what do you do with with this theologically in Islam for example you know so so, so if you're a Muslim uh, you you don't have a problem with Jesus as an historical person, he's a prophet, um, he, all, all those sorts of things. But the place where, one of the places where, where Muslims differ from Christians is the picture of what happened on the cross. And there's no exception that a prophet of God, even a prophet, never mind God and God, but a prophet of God could have died on the the cross and most Muslims would say that Jesus was uh, ascended to heaven before he was crucified and somebody else was crucified in his place or something I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not you know a scholar of Islam um, but I just find it fascinating that there's this idea that there is no way God would allow this to happen and even today it, it seems such a confronting thing to say that on the cross, God died. And yet still, that, that's, that in a sense is what we as Christians affirm. Which is a long way around to, to say you can really start to empathize with those people who, uh, who might have seen some of these events that Jesus did. Uh, and who were really quite impressed. But they didn't make the connection. They didn't make the connection that this was God with them. But rather, perhaps this was a person doing something godly or, um, or something like that. So I feel like that went, I've spoken an awful lot. Normally we'd have an opportunity for kind of some backwardsing and forwardsing with questions. Uh, if you came in... Oh, yes. Um... Uh, I'm guessing that's Alex uh, on Paul's account is is reminding us that um, you know there's this kind of contradiction uh, on the cross of you know Jesus calling out uh, Eloi Eloi lema sabachthani I think is how you pronounce it you know God experiencing the forsakenness of God um, and Peter Rowlands. Uh, is one of the theologians who works with that a lot. Um, he's not the only one, but he's he's a good accessible one. So if you want to read more about that, you can look up Peter Rollins. He's great. Um, as I was saying, as I was saying, uh, if you came in late, the notes should be kind of just under this post on Good Shepherd, uh, or alternatively, they are on the website as well under Sermons and Series. The other thing is I'm transferring all these videos slowly but surely over to YouTube uh, and the videos will also sit on our website. So 
it's there for you if you want to go back if you kind of go, ah, I'm trying to remember that and it's all there uh, any other thoughts or questions that people wanted to ask uh, quickly otherwise I will sign off and so I hope you found that interesting give me just a moment okay okay I'm going to say go in peace to love and serve the Lord bye